All righty, if you will turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12. That's where we will be at uh, this morning as we continue this series, this summer series that we've done on spiritual gifts. Just to backtrack a little bit, we've gone all the way back to first starting with who the Holy Spirit is and His work in your life. And then looking at the baptism of the Holy Spirit and its necessity in being effective in sharing Christ. And then we looked at the fact that you have a place in the body of Christ. You're not just floating out there. You are placed by Christ in the body for a purpose, for a design, and he's gifted you with those things. We looked at the church leadership gifts, those gifts to help a church run and glorify Jesus and build up the body. We've looked at the, the power gifts that are used to promote the gospel and build those testimonies. We looked at those gifts that are serving that we use within the church to build one another. Last week, we looked at love and how important love is from 1 Corinthians 13. In spite of all your gifts, if you don't have love, it doesn't mean anything to God. You want love to be that motivator. And, and today, these last two studies we're going to get into this week and next week have to do with the speaking gifts. Today, we're going to look at the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and the gift of prophecy. And next week, we will look at and conclude with the gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues. I want to encourage you, there is a little piece of paper out there in the foyer you can pick up that lists all those gifts in the Word of God and how they are used and what they're like. So that is a good tool to have with the scripture references there to use. So let's start with a word of prayer. Lord, I want to thank you for who you are. I want to thank you for your Holy Spirit that works in our lives. And we just surrender into your hands. We give you our lives and ask that you would speak to us. Draw us close to your heart and empower us and send us out, Lord, to do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. Again, a foundational principle is this, that gifts are given according to the Spirit's will, not mine. And they are given for a purpose to bless the church and build up the kingdom of God. As we've shared before, Warren Wiersbe, who's now with the Lord, said, gifts are a tool to build with, not toys to play with. And that's so solid that we remember those things. Here's your take home, though. I want to use my gifting as God designed in his word to build up God's church in his way and to glorify God's son in this world. Let me give that to you again. I want to use my gifting as God designed in his word to build up God's church in his way and to glorify God's son in the world. And when you're using your gifts rightly, listen, four things are going to happen. First of all, you are going to be blessed being used by God. Secondly, others are going to be blessed and pointed to God. Thirdly, the church is going to grow up to maturity in God. And lastly, all glory goes to Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Keep that in mind as you seek to be used by the Lord. You'll be blessed, others will be blessed, the church will be built up, and Jesus is glorified. So let's dive into these things. We're going to start in chapter 12, verse 8. He says, For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. So let's start with the word of knowledge. If I was to explain it to you, it's just supernatural knowledge and insight into something previously unknown to the person. It couldn't be figured out by human study. Let me give you a few examples. In the Old Testament, there's a story of Elisha with a Syrian king, 2 Kings chapter 6. The Syrian king was planning to attack Israel, and he, he, he made these plans, and, and Elisha warned the king of Israel, who then posted a guard in that city. And the Syrian king thought, I got a traitor in my midst. Somebody is leaking information here. And a guy came to the king and said simply, hey, Elisha tells the king of Israel the things that you're speaking behind closed doors in your own bedroom. How does that happen? The word of knowledge. We, we see in the New Testament, we see Jesus with Nathanael in chapter 1 of John. Philip brought Nathanael to Jesus. And Jesus said to him, hey, Philip, I saw you when you were under the tree. And he's like, whoa, rabbi, which means teacher, you are the son of God. A word of knowledge. Peter had it at one point. Matthew chapter 16. Look what Jesus asked him. He said to Peter, but what about you? He asked, who do you say that I am? 
And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. Look at this. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven, a word of knowledge. What about today? Well, maybe you've been sitting in a, in a church service before, and, 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 and you were brought with a friend, and all of a sudden the pastor starts talking about an issue that is directly involved in your life, as if, did somebody snitch on me? Who said that? And you find out, you go to the pastor, how did you know? And he's just like, I, I'm just, it's the Lord working in your life. Sometimes a word of knowledge can be given. You know, it was probably a couple months ago, you guys remember this, but if you were here when we were, we were having a time of worship and I just really sensed that the Lord, um, before we started, that God had, had somebody here with, that was dealing with a, uh, a health issue and an eye problem and we're really having some difficulties. And, and so I got up here and just kind of shared it. I don't know what would happen. I don't know if it applied to anybody. And then we had, you know, the time, hey, if that applied to you, then just raise your hand. We just want to pray for you. And uh, Olin was facing a, a difficulty uh, facing the doctor, and we got a chance to pray for him. And that's the beauty of the word of knowledge, is that it's going to lead us not to be some know-it-all about everything, but it's going to lead us to those avenues to pray for one another, to lift each other up to the Lord. Or maybe the word of knowledge is going to work in such a way to move you towards, hey, obey Jesus, or pursue godliness, to walk in righteousness. All those things are important. When you are going through a tough time, when fears are invading, when life seems to be crippling, the word of knowledge is so key and so important. Why? Because it reminds you of this. The God who knows everything, created everything, is involved in your life. He's interested in what's going on in your life. He knows the things you're facing. He knows what you're going through. He's not ignoring it. He's not standing aloof to say, I really don't care. No, the word of knowledge reminds us that God is concerned in perfecting the things in your life to glorify him. And that word of knowledge brings such peace to the heart. That, Lord, you created everything. And if you created the heavens and the earth and you spoke things into existence and I'm going through this issue, Lord, you know through and through. And I just appreciate, God, that word from someone else that just simply reminds me my God is still in charge. We need it. We need it every day. He knows what he's doing. He's involved. He mentions there in chapter 12, verse 8, another gift, the word of wisdom. Now, what is wisdom? Wisdom. It's not an old wise guy sitting on, on, on a hill by himself that you have to climb up to. It's been said that knowledge is facts attained and wisdom is rightfully applying that knowledge. An example, so I look down and I see this creature that's black with a white stripe and I say, hey, that's not a cat, that's a skunk. That's knowledge. Wisdom says stay away. Don't go poke at it. And through life, you're going to learn general wisdom. Little kids come up with great, wise things. You know, I reminded of, I read this this week about a, a kid by the name of Patrick. And he's only, he's only nine years old, but he said, never trust a dog to watch your food. <laughs> That's wisdom. That's general wisdom. And there was another girl, you know, 10 years old, that says, never tell your mom her diet isn't working. We can recognize general wisdom, and true wisdom comes from God as we face life's challenges, and Lord, how am I going to do this? But what does that look like? What can I expect when I need a word of wisdom, Lord? How's it going to play out? Well, I love the word of God that it tells us clearly. Look at James 3, 17 and 18. Really give us eight traits of God's wisdom. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. It means there's holiness in it, and the, it's pure through and through. It's peace-loving, that it's making peace in the midst of conflicts. It's considerate, or it's gentle in its approach. It's not forceful. It's not rough with others. The wisdom is also submissive or willing to yield, not bullheaded as if it's my way only. I'm, I, I don't want to listen to any other things. No, I, I need to listen to logic and reason and and even find a compromise that would work. 
The wisdom is full of mercy, it says there, that its mercy is seen from beginning to end. It leaves, the God's, it leaves God's fingerprints of mercy all through it. And it says, and good fruits. So it's reflecting the heart of God in the end. It's impartial, not showing favoritism, and it's sincere or without hypocrisy. It's not, as we would say, two-faced, saying one thing and doing another. And those who pursue that can have this guarantee. Those who follow it will heap a, a, a reap a harvest of righteousness. That, that's good to, to see. But if I was to explain to you the word of wisdom is simply that supernatural wisdom from the Spirit at that moment that's not from human common sense or ingenuity. It's often seen in two, two arenas, when there is a clear presentation of the gospel and when you're facing a conflict and you don't know what to do, I need a word of wisdom forward in what God has. Here's a few examples from the scripture. Some of you remember this in 1 Kings chapter 5, two ladies came to uh, King Solomon and, and said, hey, this, this baby, uh, she's claiming the, the, we both had babies and she's claiming the, the one that died is is mine, and the one that's living is hers. One rolled over in the middle of the night and, and, and crushed the kid. Terrible situation. King Solomon is facing this, and he basically says, what do we do in the conflict? Bring me a sword, and we're going to cut the baby, the living one, in half and give half to each. And the living, uh, the, the mom with the living child said, no, 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 don't do that. I'd give it to her. And the one who had the dead child and was trying to get the living child said, cut it in half. And King Solomon knew at that point, that's the true mom. A great word of wisdom in a conflict to bring peace and clarity. I think about Daniel with the king's portion in Daniel chapter one. To not eat the king's meat was a serious offense. Your lives would be at stake. But Daniel, in the conviction of his heart, said, I, I, I can't eat meat that's offered to idols. And so he said, put me to the test. Give me 10 days of my veggie diet and you can test me afterwards. And at the end of 10 days, he was wiser and stronger and more fit than the, all the others. And, and that was a, a, a word of wisdom there. Acts chapter 15, as Gentiles began to get saved, the Jewish council, so what do we do with these guys? Uh, do we circumcise them? They, they got to keep the law? And Peter stood up and says, well, why put them under a burden we can't even keep? And then James, the head of the Jerusalem church, was given the gift of wisdom and said, let's tell them this, these, these four things. Don't eat meat sacrificed to idols. Don't be sexually immoral. Don't eat meat from strangled animals. And don't drink blood. And it just made sense to everybody to go, huh, okay. And everybody went forward in grace and in love. A word of wisdom at that point. How does this help me today? I see those examples. But how does it help me today? Well, the purpose of this gift is simply to help others move forward with the Lord in grace and in truth. As you guys know, problems are inevitable. Conflicts will happen. Preferences are many. And as you face those issues, it's good to stop and say, Lord, I need a word of wisdom here that not only brings a solution to the problem, but actually brings peace in the midst of the chaos. When I'm doing a marriage counseling, I'm praying, Lord, give me that word of wisdom. When I'm doing, uh, uh, you know, thinking about ministries and how they're supposed to unfold, I'm praying, Lord, give me that word of wisdom. That in the plan forward, there is peace and there is good fruits and people are seeing Jesus and looking at him. It's okay to ask God, give me that word of wisdom in this situation I'm facing and then walk in obedience to what he gives the third one we wanted to look at is the gift of prophecy. You'll find it in 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, and so we're going to jump around a little bit in there. Uh, but it's explained as this. Prophecy is to foretell divine events or speak under the inspiration. It's twofold. It's a forth or a foretelling of prediction when we think about prophecy. And it's a foretelling of direction of God's word and will for the people to follow. So both of those aspects couple examples here from Scripture. Acts chapter 11. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. 
The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. So the, prophet, uh, the prophecy was predictive for future, and the Spirit moved on men in how to minister to one another for that time. Look at Acts 21, verse 8. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at a house of Philip, the evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus, same guy, came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, the Holy Spirit says, in this way, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. So we see two pictures. There are four daughters that prophesy. We don't know if it was predictive for the future or if it was directive instruction for them to live by. We don't know. But then Agabus comes in and he gives a predictive prophecy that happened to Paul in Jerusalem as you read the rest of the book of Acts. And I believe the gift of prophecy is seen really in a very natural way. Every Sunday when we gather together, we are exhorting, we are taking the word of God and we are exhorting each other to live by it. We are comforting one another through it. We, we are edifying and building up and telling each other, hey, keep looking forward. Heaven is our goal, not this earth. And it helps us in walking forward in God's will. Maybe points where there is a prediction of some sort, but that's in God's hand and his timing. But look at chapter 14. There are three aspects of this gift of prophecy. You can find a full study on calvarynorth.com of this chapter, but I want to just pinpoint a few things. First of all is the purpose of the gift of prophecy. Look at verse 3. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. The prophetic gift is given not to create fear, but to build faith. It's there to, as it says there, to edify, which is build up people to maturity. It's there for exhorting, meaning to send you out for activity. Get going with the Lord. And it's comforting, and that is warming the heart or drawing close. So you find people that have that prophetic word, it's going to be doing those things. It's going to be edifying, it's going to be exhorting, and it's going to be comforting. It's drawing people closer to Jesus, never from him. You see, the enemy will always seek to push you from Jesus. The Holy Spirit will never do that. So how do I know if what I'm facing is actually this word that was given to me, is, if I'm to obey it or not? Well, what's it doing? Is it drawing you closer to the Lord, or is it pushing you from him? Is it drawing you closer to rest in his promises and plans? Is it building you up or is it tearing you down? Are you seeing Jesus more? Those are valid questions to sort through. So the purpose of prophecy is that. Secondly, you'll notice in verse 5, the preeminence of prophecy. It says, I wish you all spoke with tongues, Paul is saying here, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. So he says prophecy is way better to have than the gift of tongues. Why? Because one, it's easy to understand <laughs> because it's in a known language and applied. There's no need for interpretation with the prophecy. It speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to everyone present, and it can bring conviction of sin and lead people to salvation, saying God is in your midst. And again, maybe as an unbeliever, you came to church with a friend, invited you, and the pastor started speaking about something, and you're like, dude, did you just tell him what's going on in my life? And he's like, no, God's working, revealing to draw you to himself. We see it played out. Remember in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit fell upon the church at the beginning, the tongues of fire happening? The tongues were simply to draw men to the point of prophecy where Peter shared the gospel and people got saved. The tongues were not meant for salvation. They were just meant to draw them in so that the gospel could be shared. And that's why he says prophecy is way better than having the gift of tongues. To share the word of God, that conviction may happen by the Holy Spirit. We need to seek after gifts that are most beneficial in building the body of Christ, but appreciate all the other gifts as well. Each has a measure of blessing. The third thing about tongues is that the progress of the prophecy. How is it to be used in a church? Look at chapter 14, verse 26. He says there, how is it then, brethren, whenever you come together, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, 
has a revelation, has an interpretation. Let all things be done for edification. Some have seen this as a command, like this is how your Sunday morning should go, but it really might be better equipped for a smaller group that you would have. And if you look at this, punctuation was added afterwards. More likely, there should be a question mark after the word interpretation uh, in, in verse 26, because Paul is saying here, as a church, when they got together, it was chaos. And everybody's trying to outdo each other with some sort of gift and vying for positions and stuff. And, and Paul is saying, wait, wait, time out. Do things in order. Use your gifts to build up others. It's not about you. God gives you the opportunity to be used, yes, but be careful because pride can do a number and cause damage. To promote unity and clarity and to build up the body of Christ, they needed three things to consider. One, take turns and judge what's said. Look at verse 29 of chapter 14. Let two or three prophets speak and let the others judge. Someone would speak, they would judge to see if it was true, if it lined up in Scripture. And that's how it unfolded. Acts 17, verse 11. Now, the Berean Jews were of more noble character than those in Thessalonica, for they received the message with great eagerness, that message from Paul about Jesus, and they examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. We want to be Bereans. We want to be going, taking things back to the word of God. 1 Thessalonians 5. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all and hold to what is good. So you realize that you and I have a responsibility to test those prophetic words. Number one, is it against the known word of God revealed? Then toss it out because it's no good. God's already given you his word. Number two, if what's said is edifying, exhorting, and comforting others, or is it condemning and putting down? Sometimes people think all I have to do is tag on a thus saith the Lord at the end and everybody has to obey it. No. That's not how it works. People can condemn, people can use flesh and manipulate things, and you got to be aware. And number three, did it come to pass? Because, hey, if there's a prophetic word and somebody tells you something about the future, the real question is, did it really come to pass or not? That's a test too. So he says, take turns and judge what is said. Number two, he says, don't hog the time. Look at verse 30. As they're gathered together, but if anything is revealed to another who sits by, let the first keep silent for you can all prophesy one by one that all may learn, that all may be encouraged. And the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. He says, don't hog the time. Love gives space for others to be used by God, too. Self-control is a fruit of the spirit. And some people, I, I've seen it in small groups, some people say, well, I just couldn't help myself. I had to interrupt everything. It was the spirit moving me. No, the Bible tells us that you have self-control. And there's a time, a right time and a place. And so be aware of that. Even while ministering, a person is never out of control. And we should give space for others with giftings, but my spoken giftings should promote peace in the church and not chaos. It's faith over fear. It's building up, not tearing down. And God moves in a way to bring about his peace. The third thing to consider is to remember that orderliness is important to God. Look at the end of the chapter. Paul writes and says, Therefore, brethren, desire earnestly to prophesy, and do not forbid to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. Orderliness is important to God. We live in a day and age where almost like emotionalism and chaos becomes the rule of thumb to be able to say, that's God, if I can't figure it out. But to read in the scriptures that he's a God of order, and there's a place and a purpose for what he designs. Paul gives kind of a summary of that chapter in those two verses saying, listen, desire prophecy, don't despise the gift of tongues, uh, do both, but keep it decently and in order. Order is important because God doesn't interrupt himself. And that is something for us. Let me close with this, and we're going to have a time of communion. First of all is this. Uh, John Corson said this, and I love this. He says, the Holy Spirit is pictured as a dove for a reason. He is not portrayed as a hawk coming in for the kill or a vulture, a vulture circling over the congregation to pick people to death with prophecies and words of knowledge. The dove is a bird of beauty, gentleness, and peace. 
And when the gifts and manifestations of the Spirit it represents are operating properly, the effect will likewise be beautiful, gentle, and peaceful. I'm thankful that God didn't use the pigeon as an illustration of the Holy Spirit. We have these pigeons around here, and no one likes them. Flying rats. We don't like them. But the doves, oh, bring them in. You know, let them poop on my car. That's okay, it's dove poop. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But I want to leave you with two questions. Number one, have you first received the gift of salvation that God offers you through Jesus Christ, the forgiveness of your sins? See, spiritual gifts mean nothing unless you first receive that gift. These spiritual gifts we're studying apply, don't apply to you because you haven't received that first gift, the greatest gift of salvation. The Bible tells you very clearly that God loves you. He created you, he loves you, he knows you, and sin has destroyed you. And so he sent his son Jesus down to this earth to die for your sins on that cross. And he rose again from the dead to prove to you that who he is is true, what he said is true, what he promised to you is true, that you might have the guarantee of eternal life with him. The beauty of Christianity simply is this. God came to me. I didn't reach God. The infinite reached the finite because there's no way I could better myself. And you've seen it. Sin has held you down. Sin has ruined your life. Sin has created the fears, the doubts, the insecurities, the weight. Maybe you've pushed it off. You tried to just do better. But I got to tell you this. God's not looking for you to do better. He's looking for you to surrender and acknowledge what Jesus has done for you is not better, it's the best. And when you receive it by faith, then God says you are now a brand new person, a new creation, washed clean, fresh start with heaven as a guarantee. So if you have not accepted Christ as Savior, I want to start right there. But the second question is for you who have accepted Christ as Savior is this, have you asked God to give you the spiritual gifts needed to bless his church and build his kingdom? And there's no better time than even right now. Let's pray. Oh.